In late May 2011, the small Serbian village of Lazareva shot to fame. Leading newspapers in many countries splashed its name across their front pages. It was here that Serbian police arrested General Ratko Mladic. This is the place where it happened. The worldwide manhunt for him lasted 15 years. Serbia had promised a 1 million euro reward for his capture. The general's arrest triggered acts of protest in many Serbian towns. The Serbian people are worried because The Hague and international media are smearing our hero. Some think Mladic is a war criminal. Others believe he's a victim. Many events of his life, especially in recent years, are still shrouded in mystery. The small village of Lazareva is situated in central Serbia. A repair shop and a couple of cafes are at one end. A church, a cemetery and a school are at the other. The village looks like many others in Serbia. Ratko Mladic, a general of the Serbian army, spent the last few days before his arrest hiding here in the house of his brother-in-law, Branko. Uh. I've been on friendly terms with Branko for six years. I worked in his garden every day, but never saw the general. People here are not in the habit of locking their gates and homes, but some time ago Branko began doing just that. Why do you lock the door, I asked Branko. Are you hiding your brother there? He simply laughed off my question. <laughs> As in many villages, all the people in Lazareva know one another. Everything is out in the open here. And yet, even neighbors did not suspect that an internationally wanted man was staying in a nearby house. I didn't know that Mladic was hiding here before the media broke the news. Otherwise, I would have invited him to stay at my place. It would never have been found here. Radko Mladic commanded the army of Bosnian Serbs during the civil war in the 90s in Yugoslavia. The International Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia at The Hague charged Ratko Mladic with genocide and the murder of both prisoners of war and civilians during the conflict. In July this year on trial. The small village of Bajanovici, where Mladic was born, is situated on a mountain pass in Bosnia. Most of the houses are shared by his close and distant relatives. Radko was born in this house. I was born here myself a little later. We lived here together until I moved into a house I built on my own. Now one of our relatives lives here. Holidays are not a common thing for country folk. The mountains of Serbia are especially rigorous. If they want to survive, peasants need to till the soil much harder than in the lowlands. I first cut grass with Radko when I was eight years old. He was the best mower here, and I learned the skill from him. And now I'm the best in this place. In accordance with the patriarchal traditions of peasant families, the oldest male is supposed to care for the family. Radko Mladic was born in 1943, during World War II. His father died in battle when Radko was still a child. From then on, he was the man of the house. His heart went out to hard-working people, but lazy people always got a dressing down. He almost tore me to pieces whenever I tried to get out of my chores. He took work in the field and school very seriously. He always was at the top of his class in military school, and we were all very proud of him. Radko Mladic began his career as an officer in the Yugoslav army. It incorporated all ethnic groups living in the Balkans. After World War II, Yugoslavia was a multi-ethnic federation. It was made up of states with differing ethnic populations. 
All officers of the former Yugoslavia were Yugoslavs as far as their convictions were concerned. They became Serbs only after the breakup of Yugoslavia. Radko Mladic was one of those who believed in Yugoslavia. He believed there was still a chance of reviving it. But he changed his views in 1993 after seeing Muslims murdering Serbs. They were trying to create an Islamic country in an area populated by Serbs where he himself had been born. A vicious civil war broke out in the Yugoslav Republic of Bosnia in 1992. About half of the people here follow Islam and call themselves Bosnian Muslims. A little more than a third are Catholic Croatians, which at first supported the Serbs, but ultimately sided with Bosnian Muslims. In April 1992, the Serbs surrounded the Bosnian capital, Sarajevo. Muslims made up the majority of the city's population. The siege of Sarajevo lasted four years. Traces of the siege can still be found on the streets of Sarajevo. Many locals lost relatives here. I was away at work on October the 10th, 1994, when a 125mm shell hit my house. My son and daughter were critically wounded. 28 days later, they died in hospital. It pained me greatly to see their suffering. I really wish they had died right there and then. They wouldn't have suffered so much. According to the Hague Tribunal, the siege of Sarajevo resulted in more than 10,000 deaths. Approximately 50,000 people were wounded. These figures were cited in one of the gravest indictments of Ratko Mladic. The war in Sarajevo started when Muslim terrorists attacked a Serbian wedding and started to boil when Muslim terrorists attacked a column of the former Yugoslav People's Army on Dobrovolička Street where Muslim terrorists were shooting at unarmed civilians and soldiers. The Muslims did everything to involve the world community, especially the NATO Pact, to fight on their side for their goals by staging various terrorist acts. During the war, Bosnia was divided into two countries. The Muslims called their part the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina, while the Serbs called theirs Republic Srpska. Radovan Karadic, previously a practicing psychiatrist, became leader of the Serbs. As well as president, he was also formally known as Army Commander-in-Chief. Radovan Karadzic didn't have the right skills to command troops. He had a thorough humanitarian frame of mind because of his character and occupation. The parliament of Republika Srpska took that into account when it elected Radko Mladic, the army's chief of staff. The president and the chief of staff of Republik Srpska had an uneasy relationship. The two men played according to their own rules. Under pressure by the international community, Karadzic signed a plan to divide Bosnia between Muslims and Serbs. America and Europe had guaranteed peace and all the sides involved had promised to lay down their arms if the plan was signed. But Mladic showed a map to members of parliament, making clear what the Serbs would lose if Bosnia was divided in that way. As a result, parliament refused to ratify the plan. It turned it down, as it were. Karadzic had to renounce his signature. By the end of the war, tensions between the president and the chief of staff had reached an all-time high. Radovan Karadzic signed a decree forcing Mladic to resign. In July of 1995, the Hague Tribunal indicted both on similar charges, crimes against humanity and genocide. I have heard those accusations of the Hague Tribunal against me. I am a person who belongs to my people with all my heart just like my ancestors. My people were not the first to start that war. I don't recognize any trials except the trial of my own people. I don't need to defend myself because these idiotic accusations come from places which have been churning out lies through PR. In 
In 1996, NATO demanded that Karadzic and Mladic be handed over to the Hague Tribunal. That same year, both Bosnian Serb leaders disappeared from Bosnia. When Karadzic was on the wanted list, he had no contact with any of his relatives. He rented a flat in Belgrade, posing as Dr. Dragan Dabic. He grew long hair and a beard, and wore thick-rimmed glasses as a disguise. Karadzic openly appeared on the streets and even found employment. He often went shopping and frequented the Luda Kucha Cafe near his house, where he spent time sitting amongst pictures of himself and Radko Mladic. Freedom for Radko Mladic. Today, Serbian patriots regard this cafe as a veritable mecca. Here, young people are taken on a guided tour. The cafe's owner, Misha Radic, was on friendly terms with both Karadzic and Mladic. Let's drink a toast to Karadzic and Radko Mladic. Let's wish them a fair trial and early release, because they are not guilty of what they are charged with. I hope that they can join us here as soon as possible, and we can drink together. Radovan Karadzic was on a wanted list for 12 years, before he was arrested and extradited to The Hague in 2008. Radko Mladic was in hiding for 15 years. Serbian police arrested him on May the 26th, 2011. Radko Mladic could have stayed in hiding much longer had he not used a cell phone and had he not been in touch with relatives, even distant ones. But when you are cut off from all sources of financing, you have to turn to people you know. The trouble, though, is that they may already be under surveillance. That's how you get caught. The police are in no hurry to disclose the details of how he was able to evade arrest for 15 years. But rumors leaked to the press claim he frequented his brother-in-law's house in the village of Lazareva many times. Mladic was in the room behind the second window. He saw and heard the arrival of the police. They told me what I was supposed to do during his arrest. Mladic was carrying two pistols and bullets. This is what he said to them. I could have killed you many times over, but I didn't do it, because you're not guilty of anything. Radko Mladic was extradited to The Hague in early June 2011. According to his lawyer, the former general had suffered three strokes and a heart attack while he was on the run. Yet the Hague Tribunal ruled that Radko Mladic was fit to stand trial. I am not underestimating you in any way. I hear better in my left ear and my head is cold. 